Welcome to the third and final session of the Urban Noise Webinar Series, Digitalization of Urban Noise Sensing, Noise Control and Soundscape Technologies. This event is jointly organized by Nanyang Technological University, NTU, and Housing and Development Board, HDB. My name is Calvin. I'm from the Building and Research Institute in HDB, and I'll be your MC for today. During the webinar, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them by the Q&A icon located in the devices. You can also upvote questions which are of interest to you by clicking on the thumbs up icon. Our speakers will be happy to answer some of the more popular questions at the end of the talks. In today's session, we are happy to invite two speakers to share with us some of the principles as well as the latest development in soundscape design and its potential application in urban environments. For our first speaker today, we have Assistant Professor Ju Yong Hong in Architectural and Sustainable Design from Singapore University of Technology and Design, SUTD. He has investigated relationships between physical acoustic phenomena and human perception in the indoor and outdoor environment through a multidisciplinary approach from acoustics, psychology, architect, and urban planning's point of view. Today, he'll be sharing more in his talk titled, Soundscape Design Beyond Quietness. Professor Hong, please. Okay. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ju Young Hong. I am an assistant professor at the Pillar of Architecture and Sustainable Design at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Today, I'm going to talk about soundscape, which is my main research field, with the title of Soundscape Design Going Beyond Quietness. In this talk, I would like to answer to those five big questions on soundscape. First question is, what is soundscape? And second, why soundscape is important? Third question is, how can we measure soundscapes? Fourth question is, how can we design soundscapes? And the last question, what are the challenges of soundscape research? Firstly, let's talk about what is soundscape. I think that many of you are not familiar with the concept of soundscape. The concept of soundscape was coined by Murray Schaefer, who is a music composer and environmentalist. He said that a soundscape is an acoustic analogy to landscape. There are similarities between the concept of landscape and soundscape. Namely, both are based on perception by people. According to ISO, soundscape is defined as acoustic environment as perceived or experienced and or understood by a person or people or a society in context. In other words, soundscape is understood as a perceptual construct, which is related to a physical phenomenon. The standards distinguish the perceptual construct, which means soundscape, from the physical phenomenon, which means acoustic environment. This clarifies that soundscape exists through human perception of the acoustic environment. Then, the second question, why soundscape is important? This slide shows a typical noise map which visualizes a noise level of transportation, such as road traffic, railways, or aircraft. Um, European Environmental Noise Directives actually requires member states to prepare and to publish every five years noise maps and noise manage management action plan for agglomeration with more than, you know, um, 100,000 inhabitants 
and major roads, more than 3 million vehicles a year. Uh, major railways, more than um, 30,000 trains a year. And major airports, more than uh, 50,000 movements a year. As we can see, conventional environment noise policy mainly concentrate on transportation noises, noise sources, and their noise levels. Current management of the acoustic environment is, of course, predominantly focused on sound pressure levels and noise mitigation. Consequently, its objective is to reduce sound pressure level below an acceptable guideline as shown in this slide. Basically, this conventional noise regulation builds on the concept that we can improve the acoustic quality by reducing noise level. However, is it really true? In 2005, Yang and Kang conducted on-site surveys about soundscape in urban, urban public spaces. They investigated the relationship between acoustic comfort and sound pressure levels. Interestingly, they found that there is a significant positive correlation between the sound pressure level and the subject evaluation of sound level. However, as shown in this graph, there is no significant relationship between sound pressure level and acoustic comfort until the sound pressure level becomes 65 dB. This means that sound pressure level is limited to reflect acoustic comfort. Um, as shown in this slide, traditional noise control approach mainly focuses on physical acoustic environment. However, as we know that sound pressure level is not directly related to the perception of sounds. So soundscape, which is perceptual construct of acoustic environment has become very important. And soundscape also emphasizes the importance of context. Thus, many researchers have started to adapt the concept of soundscape to understand acoustic environment in a holistic point of view. So, currently, there has been a strong need for the paradigm shift from noise control into soundscape design. And subsequently, soundscape approach will be a global policy of urban sound management in the future. Then what is the difference between conventional noise control approach and soundscape approach? In the noise control approach, we consider sounds as a waste to reduce or remove out. Meanwhile, soundscape approach considers sounds as a resource to use as a design element. So soundscape approach discriminates sound sources into a positive or negative sound sources as shown in this slide and use the positive sound sources to mask out annoying sounds or to enhance overall soundscape quality of the places. As shown in this graph, since 2009, the number of research articles on soundscape has been dramatically increasing, showing global attention and the importance of the soundscape research. So let's move on to the third question. How can we measure soundscape? To answer this question, firstly, we should understand what soundscape descriptors and indicators are. Soundscape descriptors are perceptual attributes of the acoustic environment, such as, you know, noise annoyance, pleasantness, tranquility, and soundscape quality, 
and appropriateness of soundscape. Whereas soundscape indicators are objective measures such as acoustic indicator, psychophysiological indicator, context indicators, or like these are remedial uh, indices to predict the soundscape descriptors. So for assessing soundscape, we should measure both soundscape descriptors and indicators. To accurately measure the soundscape, the triangulation model for soundscape assessment suggests to use three different methods. One is questionnaire survey, two is narrative interview, and lastly, acoustic measurement and analysis. By reflecting the triangulation model of soundscape assessment, ISO 12913 Part two provides guidelines for the soundscape data collection and reporting requirements. As shown in the section structures, the ISO provides the procedure for data collection methods, including sound walk, questionnaire, guided interview, sound source taxonomy, and binaural, binaural measurement. Also, the ISO provides annexes as shown in this slide. In particular, it is important to take a look at the Annex C about data collection methods. Basically, regarding the data collection method, there are two main approach. One is quantitative approach and the other one is qualitative approach. The ISO suggests the three different data collection methods from method A to C, and we can classify the method into these categories. For instance, method A can be classified into quantitative approach because method A consists of structured questionnaire items in terms of um, sound source identification and perceived effective quality overall soundscape quality and appropriateness of soundscape. And method B adopts both quantitative and qualitative approach consisting of, you know, structured and open-ended questionnaire items as shown in this slide. And lastly, method C is based on the guidelines of narrative interview, which is totally qualitative approach. And among these methods, we need to carefully take a look at the method A because the method A has been most frequently adopted in soundscape research. Actually, uh, method A is based on the pleasantness and eventfulness model consisting of eight objective attributes as shown in this diagram. Um, as shown in this graph, there are two main axes. One is pleasantness, the other one is eventfulness. Um, based on the, you know, eventfulness and pleasantness, we can easily describe the soundscape quality. For instance, the Byram commercial, you know, street soundscape can be described as pleasant and eventful soundscape which means exciting soundscape. And the acoustic environment in the urban parks can be pleasant and uneventful, which means a calm soundscape. Then how about a soundscape of expressway? That can be described as boring soundscape, which means unpleasant, and eventful. And how about construction noise? Construction noise has a high eventfulness and low pleasantness, which means that chaotic soundscape. For soundscape data collection, we conducted sound walk, questionnaire surveys, and audiovisual measurement simultaneously. 
as a case study of data collection and analysis of soundscape, we conducted soundscape measurement at the fourth site in the Millennium work as shown this figure in Singapore. Um, through this soundscape data collection and analysis, we can see um, sound press levels at four sites. And also we can see the dominance of sound sources identified in this location. Also, we can see the perceived effective quality at each location, which provides more holistic point of view of soundscape in the locations. So, so far, we looked at how to measure the soundscape. Then, now, let's move on to the question, how can we design soundscape? There are several soundscape design elements as shown in this slide. Sound sources itself can be an important soundscape design element. Also, we can use special factors such as, you know, reverberation and background noise to design soundscape. Of course, social cultural as well as multi-sensory aspects could be a critical design factors due to the importance of the context in soundscape assessment and design. However, in this talk, I would like to focus on how we can use the sound sources as a soundscape design element. Let's say there is an urban public space where adjacent to a major road, as shown in this slide. In this case, typical noise control approach might be to build noise barrier to reduce the traffic noise. However, installing a noise barrier is usually very costly and destroying beautiful landscape. And sometimes it is ineffective to improve acoustic comfort. So in soundscape approach, we consider sounds as a resource to design acoustic environment. So we use pleasant natural sounds such as water sounds and bird song to reduce the perceived loudness of noise and to increase the soundscape quality and attract users' attention from the target noise. So I would like to share some examples of soundscape design using natural sound in European countries. This, is, um, this example is Chef Square, located in Sheffield, UK. In this project, the landscape designer installed a metal sculpture acting as physical noise barrier, as well as a water features to mitigate the traffic noise and provide a pleasant sounds to the urban square. Second example is a Nauna Park, which is located in Berlin, Germany. In this project, the architects renovated a playground and installed an embedded speaker system in the street furniture in order to generate pleasant natural sounds to mask out loud traffic noise nearby. However, aforementioned soundscape design projects are not based on the scientific results and evidence. So in order to investigate the masking effect of natural sounds, um, we can use VR and AR together with 3D audio technology in order to provide immersive experience to the subject. So VR soundscape tool can be used in the laboratory condition as shown in this slide. And AR soundscape tool can be used in in-situ test, which means that real, you know, life scenario. So by using AR and VR tools, we can investigate the masking effect of natural sounds with high ecological valid results. As shown in this slide, NTU team and I developed 3D audio visual capturing system. We used 360 video camera and ambisonic microphone 
that can capture 3D audio visual environment. And the, you know, the audio visual recordings can be used in a VR experiment. Also, uh, we suggested AR soundscape tool prototype consisting of HoloLens and binaural microphone and portable audio recorder. Uh, based on this uh, AR and or mixed reality system, we can conduct you know, in-situ soundscape experiments in real life scenario. Firstly, we conducted a laboratory uh, experiment to examine the effect of natural sound on soundscape. In this experiment, we set the three different noise level from 55 and 65 and 75 in a step of 10 dB. As a Moscow sound, uh, we selected a bot song and stream sound, which are uh, pleasant. And we varied uh, Moscow to noise ratio from minus 6 dB to plus 6 dB in a step of 3 dB. So let's play the traffic noise we used. And let's listen to the combined sounds of traffic noise and butt sound. And the combined sounds of traffic noise and stream sound. Based on this combination, we asked participants to evaluate two um, soundscape attributes. One is perceived loudness of noise and overall soundscape quality. This is the result in terms of reduction of perceived loudness of noise by adding natural sounds. Um, we found that Introducing natural sounds can reduce approximately 20 to 30% of perceived loudness of noise. Also, we found that the Moscow level is not necessarily to be louder than the traffic noise level to reduce the perceived loudness of noise. This slide Um, this is the result in terms of enhancement of soundscape quality by adding natural sounds. Similarly, adding natural sounds could significantly increase the soundscape quality by approximately 20 to 36 percent. Interestingly, when the traffic noise level becomes 75 dB, people tend to prefer um, lower Moscow level than the traffic noise level itself. Secondly, we also conducted in situ experiments to validate the effect of natural sound in real life scenario. The main research question was, what is the most preferred natural sound level corresponding to the ambient traffic noise level? And this slide shows the equipment setting for the in-situ soundscape experiments that consists of AR, HMD, and binaural mic, and portable acoustic data acquisition instrument, and Bluetooth keyboard. And this short video will introduce briefly how we conduct the AR in-situ experiment.
So um, this slide shows the results of the in situ experiment. Um, as the same as the you know laboratory experiments, we found that um, there is a significant effect of natural sound on reducing perceived loudness of noise and enhancing overall soundscape quality, even in real life scenario. And also we found that there are strong and negative correlation between preferred Moscow to noise ratio and the ambient you know, traffic noise level. And based on the relationship, we developed a simple linear regression models in order to predict the preferred natural sound level responding to the LAQ, I mean the sound pressure level of traffic noise. And I believe that these models um, could be used to develop the adaptive soundscape generation system in the future. And finally, this is the last question. What are the challenges of soundscape research? Um, this table clearly summarizes the current challenges in soundscape research into five themes. The first, there is a significant gap between academia and practice. Thus, more efforts to bridge the soundscape research and practice are needed in the future. Second, regarding the applicability of the soundscape framework, we need to put more effort to explore how to adapt the current urban soundscape frameworks for other contexts or disciplines. Third, future studies on multisensory interaction in soundscapes are necessary to identify the impacts of other sensory input for soundscape assessment. Fourth, relationship between soundscape behaviors and physiology are not yet fully investigated much. Lastly, regarding the technology for soundscape, it is essential to conduct a research on how to use and integrate emerging technology such as VR, AR, and sensing technology ICT platform into soundscape research. In this context, NTU team and I have been conducting a soundscape research project, so-called uh, Augmenting Urban Soundscape AUS Phase 2, in order to develop an adaptive soundscape enhancement system and evaluation of urban sound environment. This project consists of three uh, thrusts, as shown in this diagram. In thrust one, uh, we're going to develop the adaptive soundscape masking algorithm that responsive to the ambient uh, noise characteristic. And in thrust two, using the you know, AUS algorithm from thrust one, we are going to design and develop and deploy the actual prototype of AUS system. And lastly, in thrust three, we are going to examine the effect of AUS system through psychological, physiological, and behavioral study. And we're expecting that the AUS system in this project can be deployed in urban public space in Singapore, such as rooftop gardens, in order to transform the noisecape into passive soundscape. And this project will contribute to the field of soundscape with three aspects as shown on this slide. First, this project will provide a perception-driven design and display tools for soundscape. And second, this will provide a smart solution for transforming to a livable soundscape. And lastly, the AU system will improve the utilization of urban public space and public health. And I would like to end my presentation with the Murray Shepherd saying that the home territory of soundscape studies will be the middle ground between science, society, and the arts. 
So I strongly believe that sustainable and livable urban soundscape can be designed and achieved through the interdisciplinary approach by integrating the psycho, physiological, and behavioral studies, and acoustic sensing technology, and architectural and urban planning. Thank you for your kind attention. If you have any questions for him or his talk, um, feel free to submit your questions uh, using the Q&A button. And remember to upvote those questions that are of interest to you. Next, we have our second speaker, Dr. Ban Lam, who is currently a research fellow in the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering in NTU, Singapore. Dr. Lam obtained his PhD from NTU in 2019 on active control of noise through an open window. In recent times, he has been exploring the synergy between active noise control and the soundscape paradigm. Today, he will share some of the methods to leverage upon the emerging extended reality technologies for soundscape research in his talk titled, Virtual, Augmented and Mixed Reality for Soundscape Evaluation and Design. Dr. Lam, please. Hello everyone, my name is Ban. I'm delighted and privileged to be here to be able to share some of the work we are doing at Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore. Today, I would like to talk about how we are leveraging upon and developing immersive display and spatial audio technologies to evaluate and design soundscapes. There are four parts to this talk. In the first part, I will firstly reiterate the perceptual concept of soundscapes and highlight the interaction between hearing and vision, followed by a framework on how to go about designing soundscapes, and then talk about how to conduct perceptual evaluations of soundscapes. Then we will look at some gaps that we are trying to close so that we can move soundscapes from academia to practice. In the second part, I will talk about the current state of immersive sound or spatial audio and how we go about recording and reproducing it for immersive realities like virtual reality. This is followed by the third part concerning immersive visuals. I will describe how to record spherical videos for virtual reality and then followed by an overview of different immersive reality displays. And lastly, how spatial audio and immersive visuals are presented together in a VR workflow. Finally, in the fourth part, I will show two applications built by undergraduate students in our lab, a VR application for soundscape evaluation and a mixed reality application for soundscape design. As we now know, soundscape focuses on the human perception of sound. It is defined in ISO 12913 part one as the acoustic environment as perceived or experienced and or understood by a person or people in context. Is that there are a number of factors that can influence the interpretation of sounds we hear, such as attitude related factors like experience and expectations, and other sensory factors like visual impression and smells. In this talk, I will focus on perceptual evaluation methods because objective methods are quite well defined in the ISO 12913 Part 2 standard. One of the strongest factors that affect how we perceive and understand sound is our vision. What we see can bias what we hear, and that effect can go the other way as well. This is called audiovisual interaction. There is a well-known audiovisual illusion called the McGurk effect that demonstrates audiovisual interaction. Let's take a look now at a clip from BBC Horizon explaining the McGurk effect. Ba, ba. Have a look at this. What do you hear? Ba, 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 ba. But look what happens when we change the picture. Ba, 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 ba. And yet, the sound hasn't changed. In every clip, you are only ever hearing ba with a B. Ba, ba.
So the interesting thing about this effect is that it works even if you know about it. The importance of audiovisual interaction can be seen in the increasing number of soundscape studies, as well as an increased adoption of immersive displays such as VR headsets. So now if you're interested in designing or renovating the soundscape of a location, what do we do? In 2017, we proposed a three-stage framework for soundscape design. When we want to design or renovate the soundscapes of a location, be it a park or in a hospital, we will first have to understand the existing soundscape. Find out what sounds are desired and what are not. This is followed by a planning and design stage where you test different interventions, such as adding barriers, adding natural sounds, or relocating features. All this while conducting evaluations with stakeholders or focus groups. Finally, after the design is implemented, a verification evaluation can be conducted to obtain feedback and may lead to further iterations of the design. You can see by now that Soundscape evaluation is at the heart of all this. Evaluation is required in every stage, either in the real in-situ environment or in a virtual setting. For instance, in stage one, you can either analyze the in-situ location by conducting surveys on-site or record the audiovisual information of the real location and play it back in a virtual environment in a lab using virtual reality. In the design iteration stage, you can either augment real or virtual objects into the existing space you want to renovate, like a park, or fully synthesize in virtual reality, especially for locations that have not been built. In the final stage, techniques in stage one and two can be utilized to analyze as well as to see and hear the tweaks to the design. Now let's look at some evaluation methods that I've briefly described. For the most realistic condition, the evaluation should be done on site. This is what we call sound walks. However, conditions outdoors can vary drastically and it may be difficult to pinpoint plausible causes of the observations. It is also difficult to repeat the evaluation with such varying conditions. Therefore, many audiovisual studies have been conducted in a lab. This was previously done with 2D images or videos displayed on a monitor. The use of VR is now the norm in soundscape evaluations to reproduce immersive environments for greater realism. The availability of augmented and mixed reality, mixed reality displays have also allowed us to experiment with a mixed modal environment where virtual elements are fused with the real environment. This allows the design under test to be introduced virtually rather than having to build the real feature like a fountain as shown here. Undoubtedly, qualitative evaluation is time consuming, but we can now leverage on immersive technologies like VR to establish an evaluation workflow in a lab environment while still achieving a high degree of realism. However, these immersive audiovisual technologies are still emerging, which means that much effort is still needed to leverage on such technologies. For instance, there is still no straightforward integration and customization of workflows for soundscape evaluation. The other problem is the lack of standards available for recording and playback of immersive audiovisuals, as well as the manufacturer of related equipment. An international consensus is important for standardization. So now let's look first look at the audio part of immersive audiovisual systems and see the current developments in this area. Let's start with stereo sound. This is what you normally get when you put on headphones or earbuds to listen to music. It's just two streams or two channels of audio, one for each for your left or right ears. In the middle, we have surround sound, which is usually experienced from a set of specially positioned speakers. You will find this in a home theater setup, usually dubbed 5.1 or 7.1, and a more elaborate setup in movie theaters. 
A sound comes from specific speaker positions to give a sense of direction, but it lacks depth. Next, we have spatial sound. Spatial sound or 3D audio replicates the way sound is heard naturally in the environment. So it represents an enhanced immersive audio experience where sounds can flow around you, including overhead in a three-dimensional virtual space as defined in the NC CTA 2085 standard. I will introduce two of the most common ways to capture and experience spatial audio. One of the most straightforward ways is to use binaural audio. Binaural audio is almost exclusively experienced through headphones or earphones. Hence, it is also a two-channel audio track, but it is not stereo, as shown earlier. It must be recorded either with a binaural microphone at the ear opening, as shown here, or with a calibrated artificial head system like the one over here. The sound that is captured includes the filtering effect of the human ear and also reflections from the human torso. This effect helps us to perceive the space around us and the use of calibrated artificial head systems to record the acoustic environment during an on-site interview or for playback in the lab is also a compulsory requirement as stated in ISO 12913 part two. One issue with binaural capture, however, is the head lock problem. The head lock audio issue is visualized here on the right. You can see that the sound source, the red pulsating circle, follows the rotation of the head. For true immersion, the sound source has to be anchored while the user explores the space, like how it is in real life. This can be achieved by tracking the head movements to ensure that the sound stays where it is supposed to be, as shown in the animation here on the left. This is what we call head track audio. To achieve head track spatial audio, I will now introduce the second method called Ambisonics to record and playback spatial audio. Ambisonics was developed in the 70s but has re-emerged as the format of choice for virtual, augmented and mixed reality audio. It captures and represents the sound feel in a spherical manner which means it can be converted to virtually any audio format. In its simplest form, it uses a four microphone arrangement as shown on the left, which is also called first order ambisonics. You can easily get these microphones now off the shelf, like the ones produced by Rode or Sennheiser. To obtain higher resolution, there are higher order ambisonic microphones, like the Icon Mic and Zyliot, as shown here. One downfall is the sheer number of audio channels associated with ambisonic setups. First order ambisonics has four channels of audio, second order ambisonic has nine, and third order has 16. At the moment, most digital audio workstations provide support up to third order ambisonics, which has only happened in the past few years. As mentioned earlier, binaural recordings using binaural microphones or artificial head systems are almost exclusively produced over headphones and not speakers and binaural recordings produce a head lock experience as shown in the animation here. On the other hand, ambisonics can be decoded to any audio format. To recreate immersive spatial audio for soundscape evaluations, we can produce head track binaural audio or use a multi-speaker setup. Ambisonics can be decoded to head track binaural by incorporating track head movements together with a digital version of the filtering effect of the human ear and the torso, also known as the head-related transfer function. Head movements can be obtained directly from the gyroscope and accelerometers of virtual reality headsets or from a head tracking system. There's also a growing trend where gyroscope and accelerometers are built into regular headphones such as in the Apple AirPods Pro. There is also a growing database of head-related transfer functions from different artificial head systems and also those of human volunteers. 
A speaker array setup is more cumbersome as it requires an acoustically treated space with a large number of speakers. Previously at NTU, we did a comparison between the speaker array and head track binaural and found that head track binaural was sufficiently appropriate for soundscape evaluations. We had published this study in Elsevier Building and Environment. And at the moment, we are working to close the gap between the headphone playback quality and the speaker system. Let's move on to immersive visuals. And nowadays, the term 360 video or spherical video is becoming commonplace. You can visualize it as a video that is stretched out in a sphere surrounding the user who is at the center. Although you can watch 360 video content through a screen on your computer or smartphone, spherical video is best experienced in a virtual reality display for a truly immersive experience. In the last two years, recording 360 video has become a breeze. Most cameras now output a stitched spherical video ready to be uploaded to YouTube or played back on a VR video player. You can buy such cameras from mainstream brands like GoPro and Insta360 for less than $1,000. There are also more professional grade cameras that offer much greater resolution if you want to future-proof your workflow. This is analogous to buying a 4K camera before 4K displays were widely available. However, these professional grade cameras come in at about $10,000. So far, we have only talked about visuals for virtual reality displays. There is now a growing number of immersive displays, which is probably creating some confusion. So let's look at how the industry defines them. We sort of know now what is a virtual reality display. There's also augmented reality displays and a newer mixed reality display. These three displays come under a recently coined term called the X reality, or some call it extended reality. In the CTA 2069 standard, virtual reality is described as a fully immersive user environment affecting or altering the sensory input like vision, sound, touch, and smell. So VR headsets tend to block off your vision and hearing to fully immerse you in a virtual environment, as shown in the GIF here. Currently, there are now fully wireless VR systems like the Oculus Quest, or theater systems hooked up to powerful graphic cards that provide greater display resolutions like the Vive Pro. Augmented reality, overlays digitally created content into the user's real-world environment. Most AR content is consumed on mobile phones, like the newly launched Google Maps AR, where directions are overlaid onto the video stream through the camera, or in AR games like Pokemon Go and Harry Potter Wizards Unite. AR glasses like the Google Glass and Vuzix Blade are almost exclusively found in enterprise solutions where it is used to aid workers in industries like aerospace manufacturing. For instance, information about the tools or assembly instructions can be projected into the field of view. Thirdly, we have mixed reality, which seam seamlessly blends a user's real-world environment with digitally created content, where both environments coexist to create a hybrid experience. This differs from AR such that virtual objects are not just overlaid onto the real world, but react to the physical environment as well. For example, the toy car shown in the GIF gets occluded by the table as it travels under it. Therefore, these MR systems have to track the environment in real time. At the moment, there are perhaps only two well-known mixed reality head-mounted displays the Magic Leap 1, and Microsoft's HoloLens and HoloLens 2. Finally, we have XR, an umbrella term 
to cover the multiple types of experiences and technologies across virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and any future similar areas. All of these systems have in common some level of display technology, both audio and visual, mixed with a method to track where the user is looking or moving. At this year's Augmented World Expo 2020, chip maker Qualcomm gave a glimpse of what the future of XR devices could be within the next decade. From where we are today with standalone VR and MR devices, we can see a fusion of such devices into a single hybrid XR device, which can transform between VR and MR modes and is fully connected to the web via 5G. At NTU, we are now experimenting with and developing frameworks, workflows, and tools for such immersive devices. For virtual reality, we have constantly updated our workflow as both the display and spatial audio technology mature. This is our workflow to create head track binaural audio synced with a recorded 360 video of a soundscape. The video and audio is first captured separately and then time synchronized. The stitched 360 video obtained directly from the camera is loaded into a VR video player and the Amazonics track is loaded into a regular digital audio workstation like Reaper or Pro Tools. Head rotation information is retrieved from the VR headset and synced to the digital audio workstation so that the decoded binaural track can be rotated in sync with the user's head movements in real time. The workflow for mixed reality headsets like the Microsoft HoloLens are highly dependent on the manufacturer's interface and is best shown through an example in the last part of this talk. We recognize that it is not easy to adopt immersive audiovisual systems, even for soundscape academics, as we are a highly interdisciplinary field. Therefore, we will show two examples of what we have built in NTU to bridge this gap. I will first show a VR application for soundscape evaluation or assessment and a MR application for soundscape design. Both of these were built by final year undergraduate students in our lab. From what I've shown so far, customization for VR is a technically prohibitive and daunting task. It is mainly developed on the open source Unity platform and does not integrate well with existing spatial audio workflows in digital audio workstations like Facebook 360 audio plugin in Reaper. The current way to do surveys in VR is also inefficient. To answer survey questions, participants usually have to provide verbal responses to be captured by the investigators or to do the survey afterwards based on memory. Because of this lack of accessible tools to perform acoustic evaluations in VR, we proposed and developed a framework that hopefully allows any non-technical person to use VR for soundscape evaluation. We have adopted a modular concept, so elements of the system can be easily modified. One such element is the questions in the questionnaire, which can be easily modified in a text editor like Notepad. The essence of this system is such that the questions are projected through the VR scene and can be answered by the participant easily through a handheld VR controller. So it looks something like this. The questions are shown in the field of view and the participant selects his or her answers using the controller guided by a virtual laser pointer. So here we have an animated example of of the questions inside the VR scene. The digital audio workstation is synchronized with the VR application so that the audio can be easily modified by the investigator as well. This is another example showing a zero to 100 rating scale to compare different audio tracks for the same VR video. In the mixed reality application, we believe this will be a useful tool 
for designing and renovating existing soundscapes without building the physical features during the design iteration stage for time efficiency and to reduce costs. These tools have yet to be developed in the context of soundscape design. We have also implemented a real-time feedback system so that important acoustic parameters like sound pressure level can be displayed in the user's field of view in real time. This MR application was built in the Unity platform as well and deployed onto the Microsoft HoloLens. Details of both this MR application and VR application shown earlier will be presented in the Internoise 2020 e-Congress from 23rd to 26th August. What we have built can be explained in this block diagram. The HoloLens registers voice and gesture inputs that allow the user to manipulate virtual objects such as volume, as shown here, where the volume is adjusted by dragging the slider. The sound from the virtual objects are spatialized and directed to the headphones of built-in speakers in the headset. The signal from the internal microphone is analyzed to obtain the sound pressure level, which is displayed on the screen, like shown like this shown over here. This is a snapshot of the scene as recorded from the HoloLens mixed, real mixed reality device. The ambient sound level, pressure level is shown at the top right corner. The volume can be adjusted through the gestures as shown. The objects can also be moved or rotated to desired locations and anchored onto the scene. Through this talk, I have briefly introduced soundscape perceptual evaluation methods using virtual and mixed reality. I've also distinguished between virtual, augmented, mixed, and extended realities, and introduced a basic workflow for virtual reality capture and reproduction with spatial audio. Finally, I've shown two examples of virtual reality and mixed reality applications for evaluation and design of soundscapes. We will continue to build tools to ease the complexity in implementing extended reality technologies, moving closer to an end-to-end -end suite of immersive reality tools for soundscape evaluation. I would like to acknowledge the funding support for the work done from the Ministry of National Development and the Singapore National Research Foundation. Thank you for listening. You can find out more of our works in my ResearchGate profile and also try out the VR application if you have the tools by forking from the GitHub repository.